Uh, this is week number five, our summer series, The Grace Impact. Key idea for today is this. Jesus didn't get stuck with you. Isn't that good to know? It's not like, oh no, I'm stuck. I'm stuck with him. Jesus chose you to be a part of his kingdom team. Jesus has chosen and accepted and adapted you and adapted me into his forever family. That's the key idea. Ever been a, a part of a game where captains were choosing teams? I'm sure you all have. And, and have you ever been that one who wasn't as talented, who wasn't the best at whatever you're playing, dodgeball, basketball, spelling bee, uh, last? Captains typically pick who they think is the best teammates. Uh, so I choose Schrock. Uh, I choose Overbeak, I, I choose his song, I choose Cole, and now you're standing and standing and standing. You ever had that? Craig, you haven't, because they always pick you first. But the rest of us, it's like, really, really? And now you're, you're last, and finally the captain looks at you. You're the last one, and everybody knows it. Okay, I'll take Ellis. And they mutter under their breath, stuck with Ellis again. Uh... I'm convinced that's how most followers of Jesus feel about being a part of the team of King Jesus. I think most of us, thinking I'm not very good, matter of fact, my life is really messy right now, I'm damaged, I've been abused, everyone thinks I'm defective and faulty, I'm going nowhere. I think Jesus, captain of the kingdom, I think he regrets choosing me to be a part of his team. I think right now he's thinking, you know what? They've got all these hurts, habits, hang-ups, uh, getting their tail whooped all the time. Jesus is stuck with me and his family. I think he could have done better with someone else. Now I want to see how that, I'll call that stinking thinking, uh, how does that stinking thinking compare to God's inspired words. Locate with me on your phone or in your Bible, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and, and we're going to see how thinking, well, he's stuck with me, how that really lines up with how Jesus thinks about you and me. Would you stand with me if you're able? We're going to read just verses 3 through verse 6. It's powerful, good stuff. Uh, this is God's inspired words words. Let's read. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will, to the praise of His glorious grace, which He's freely given us in the one He loves. Let's pray. Lord, I'm confident that lots of us here today, we believe doctrinally, biblically, the words we just read, but practically they don't affect our lives. So would you change that? Would you allow, Lord, the words that we just declared out loud to one another to actually begin to take root? Take root in our minds, in our hearts, in our wills. And Lord, I pray that as we understand how you view us, therefore what's true about it, I pray that you might give us the strength and the power from your spirit, from your book, to start changing. And start living out the words we just read. We've got lots of excuses. Lord, lots of things bad have happened to each and every one of us standing here today. So would you help us to sweep away our feelings and our experiences and line up our lives with what your word declares is true about us. Help us to accept your grace. Even though... A lot of what we're going to talk about right now, Lord, seems too good to be true. Lord, would you help us to know it is true? Because you said it. 
and we believe it. Lord, would you help us to start thinking this way? Would you help us to start speaking this way? Lord, would you help us begin in your power daily to behave this way? Not so that we can look good and religious and goody two-shoes, Lord. Really, we want to shine bright for your son, Jesus. We want to give him glory and honor and praise with how we live on a daily basis. And all the church family at Walloon Lake said with one united voice, We were not made to live without purpose or destiny. Matter of fact, I could give you a bunch of stories about people uh, who didn't feel they had a purpose or a destiny, uh, prisoners of war, and as long as they knew they were actually doing something, they were fine. But as soon as they recognized that they really didn't have a reason to live, things went very bad. Bad and, and many of them gave up, and many of them did really foolish things. Uh, questions like, does anybody care? Do I really matter? Am I counting for anything? Am I making a difference in this world? And I'm telling you, people who lose hope, people who have no purpose in life, go one of three directions, okay? If you don't have any purpose, if you don't have any meaning, if you don't have any reason for living, here's where you go. Some people give up on life and they actually either attempt suicide or they actually murder themselves. I've actually been a part of several funerals where folks literally took their own life. And here's what they all have in common. Ready? They lost hope. They, they, they felt they had no meaning. They felt they had no purpose. Now what's interesting is, then when we celebrated their life, it actually came out that that wasn't true at all. They believed a lie, but that's how they viewed their life. And, and they were so hopeless and so helpless that, that some of them that I've been a part of, they actually ended their own lives. And what happens with that and how does that, that's a different sermon. We'll get to that someday, but that's not today's purpose. But I'm just telling you, you got no purpose, no destiny. Don't feel like you're making a difference. It'll take you a really bad place. Uh, second direction that people choose is, uh, I, got, I got really nothing going on, no meaning, no purpose, no destiny, so I'm going to numb myself up. And it's amazing how some people numb themselves up. Uh, some say, you know, and I'm, I'm just going to going to drink like crazy uh, because that makes me not feel anything and therefore alcohol will numb me up. Others choose prescription drugs or all sorts of uh, heroin and sort of drugs. Why? Why do they do that? Typically, it's not because they enjoy, they, they just don't want to face reality. They don't want to face the fact they have no meaning, no purpose in life. Uh, some choose pornography. Again, um, it's, it's a way of not dealing with reality. Others numb themselves with countless hours on the book of faces. Others with the snappy chat stuff. Others just plain old television. Some people overwork. Some people overplay. Why do they do that? Because they feel they're going nowhere. They're not making a difference. They feel insignificant. So you've got to numb the pain somehow. And, and I just touched. There's hundreds of ways people numb the pain they're in. Third direction, people feeling like they have no purpose, no destiny, is the one I'm hoping will be happening today. I'm hoping that if you're in that, if you're in that situation today, I'm praying and have been all week long, the Lord might grab a hold of your heart and your mind and show you that in Jesus Christ, you have purpose, you have destiny. In Jesus Christ, everything changes. Or if you're here, and this is primarily, I'm aiming this at folks who've trusted in Jesus, and you're trusting and following Christ. But I want you to know, if you're one of those who haven't, maybe you're listening online, you've never said yes to Jesus, 
this, this is available to you too. So here's my prayer. This is from the New Living Translation, Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. I like how it reads, Long ago, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy without fault in his eyes. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. Good stuff. It really is. Before the creation of the world. Think with me now. Before anything existed, Genesis 1.1, before Jesus spoke Lake Charlevoix, Lake Michigan, and Walloon Lake into existence. Got that in your head? Before Jesus spoke the pictured rocks, wow, just went there, uh, Mackinac Island, Beaver Island into existence. Before Jesus spoke into existence the Grand Canyon, Pacific Ocean, Rocky Mountains. Ready? God chose you. He was already thinking about you being on His team. He handpicked you, give me your eyes, to be a part of His forever family. And, and we're thinking, I, that, I, I'm not sure. That, that sounds too good. Jesus handpicked you before anything existed in the, in, in the universe. He handpicked you. He said, I want you to be a part of my team. I, I've got you in mind. So since it sounds too good to be true, I, I think some of us, we need to start saying it and hearing ourselves say it. So, s repeat after me. Jesus handpicked me to be a part of his forever family. Okay, now you're just now starting to believe it a little bit. Jesus handpicked me to be a part of his forever family. Okay, now we're going to get really tricky, okay? Because we're going to insert our names, okay? So now we're going to get real personal. So I'm going to say Jeff, but you don't say Jeff unless your name is Jeff, okay? Yeah, got it. Okay, here we go. Jesus handpicked Jeff to be a part of his forever family. A few of you said Jeff. I heard you. <laughs> okay, uh, so why? Why, Jesus? Why, why would you do that? Why? We get an answer. Verse 6, to the praise of His glorious grace. Why did He do it? We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We didn't merit it. We didn't achieve it. Matter of fact, when did Jesus do the picking? Think about it with me. Before there was it, you didn't do anything. You didn't earn, merit, deserve anything. It was a grace pick from the beginning. And Here's what you need to say, verse 5, In love, Jesus accepted and adapted me into his forever family. In love, he did that. Now, my experience is this. You've heard that. You've heard it before. You know that, oh yeah, Jesus chose me. He picked me. He accepted me. He adopted me. I'm a part of his forever family. I've got all these facts stored up in my brain. But we mark those facts as doctrine. That, that's theology. And those are things, they're good, they're true. I believe them. But oftentimes we say, but that really doesn't affect my everyday life. Because that's doctrine stuff. That, that's theology. And, and you're thinking, well, that's good and I believe all that. But I'm um, feeling worthless. I feel like my life doesn't matter. Don't have much of a purpose or a destiny. Ephesians 1, 3-6 doesn't really change how I feel about myself. You understand the disconnect? Yeah, yeah, I get it. And I even believe it. But these deep biblical truths, they don't follow me to work. <laughs> they're, they're, not, they're, not, they're not active on the job. They, they're not helping we, me with my boss. Uh, you know, this situation I'm facing that's awful right now, Ephesians 1, 3 to 6, it really doesn't matter in this situation. It doesn't affect how I parent. 
It doesn't matter when I'm in the ditch and I landed in sin again. You see the disconnect? We're looking at this and we're saying, oh, oh yeah, I, I get it, I believe it, but it just doesn't affect my everyday life. So I want to spend the rest of our time trying to make the connection. I, I want to spend the rest of our time this morning trying to ex- just connect the fact that you are chosen, accepted, adopted, loved into the forever family of Jesus. Well, then how does that grace impact my life? There we go. You ready? First, later in his letter to the church at Ephesus, got your phone, got your Bible, go to uh, Ephesians chapter 6, would you? Because it tells us something really important and you need to understand. This is a part of the disconnect. Matter of fact, I think this is the major reason for the disconnect. It says, finally, verse 10, Ephesians 6, Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty armor. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against what? What's it say? Against what? Take your stand against the... For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Okay, almost always when I have a problem, I put a face to it, don't you? Okay, might be a politician, it might be a relative, it might be somebody at work, it might be a grumpy neighbor, but look what it says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Which means... Our ultimate battle here on earth as followers of King Jesus is against Satan and his demonic forces of evil. Got it? So so we're in a war, we're in a battle, and there's this other team who hates Jesus, which means they hate, they despise followers of Jesus, and their total mission is to destroy, devour, and render useless people who call themselves followers of Jesus. Does that make sense? The, their whole mission, and they work tirelessly, they, they don't need to sleep or take a day off or take vacation, they work tirelessly to destroy and devour us. And here's what the enemy is constantly trying to do. Give me your eyes. You are worthless. You are defective, you are damaged goods, you are never going to make a difference, you you are never going to make a difference in this world, why even try? Jesus is really sorry he ever chose you, he doesn't want you, he's stuck with you, and he's sorry that he adopted you into his family. And every time we mess up, the megaphone goes off again, and it's yelling at us. And we have a part of us, that old fallen nature, we agree. You're right. I am defective. I am a mess. I am damaged. Why is it so hard to believe that Jesus chose, accepted, adopted us into his forever family? It's Because every time we slip and fall, the enemy is quick to say, you're right. See, there you go again. You you did it again. You, you, you messed up yesterday, and here you've messed up already three times today. Just just quit. Don't even try. You're, you're not making a difference. You're unwanted. You're unneeded in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Why would Jesus want a faulty mess like you in his family? And here's the truth over time. This fallen world is built to reinforce that message because Satan is the the king of this fallen world. He and his demonic forces are experts at lying, whispering, and reinforcing the accusing, you're a mess, you're faulty, you you can't be used. And then there's a part of us, our old sin, we agree. And over time, we've listened so much that after time, after time, year after year, You know, a lot of us, we're just sitting on the sidelines waiting to die. I hope I got my name written in the Lamb's book because I can't make a difference here. I'm just going to sit on the sidelines and wait 
And Lord, take me because I'm, I'm no good. I'm worthless here on earth. Can I just tell you? Statistically, the majority of the church is in that situation. I don't think you can use me. So I'm just going to wait around. I'm not going to do much because I can't do anything because I'm worthless. I'm hopeless. And, and I'm just going to wait for Jesus to call me home. I hope. Because when you live that way, there's no assurance. So, it really boils down to this. Every morning when you wake up, am I thinking and speaking and acting out of that foundation? I'm going nowhere. I've got no destiny. I've got no purpose. I, I'm worthless. And this is the foundation that Satan and his demonic evil forces and this fallen world and a part of me, that old sinful self, all of that wants you to make that the foundation of your life. Working hard, very effective, working tirelessly to get us to buy into that. Or, they say this, okay? Some of you, well, well, I, I, I think I'm okay, but if, if you're not buying that, here's the other lie, you ready? Work for it, earn it, merit it. You better get all A's, you better be the best, you, you better earn every little bit of what you'll receive back. Otherwise, no one will love you. Jesus doesn't want you unless you're perfect, unless you have your act together in every way. So you work and earn, and then maybe Jesus and a few others will love, appreciate, and accept you. And when we don't measure up, guess what? No one does. Even the best and the brightest, the most talented all fall short. So when we mess up, then we're in this life of desperation and despair because I didn't do it perfectly and now I'm not earning the love and the acceptance that I so desperately want. I'm telling you, it, it's, it's, it's a tough lie. And there's a part of us that we buy into it, whether it goes earn it or I'm just not worthy, I can never measure up. So, here's the alternative. You ready? That, that's, that's sad. And most followers of Jesus, I'm convinced, buy into some form of that. Here, here's the alternative. You might want to write this down, because this is something you don't naturally think of. My destiny is written down and secured by the love and the grace of my Creator and my Savior, Jesus Christ. It's written down. Matter of fact, it was written down, recorded, and this plan took place before he created anything. Which means, give me your eyes, I know, throw me your eyeballs up here. I have a meaningful, purpose-filled future because Jesus Christ has chosen me. Because Jesus Christ has accepted me. Because Jesus Christ has adopted me into his forever family. And I'm just telling you, if you get that as your foundation, everything changes. If you finally say, no, no, I'm not going to believe the lies, the whispers, I'm not going to believe what this fallen world, or even what my old sinful flesh says, got to earn it, got to merit it. I'm going to believe what is true about me because of Jesus. Okay? If you're trusting in Jesus this morning, the roots, the foundations of your life, were planted before he even created anything in the cosmos. Okay? Jesus has you in mind. Think about it. Way back before he, he tossed the planets into place with his words, he had you in mind. And I'm telling you what, if you really start, and he had your personality and your talents and gifts to be used in his kingdom, and he wants your life to be a part of accomplishing His plan in and through Jesus Christ in us. So, that means there's no unimportant days in our lives. There, there's no, well, this, life, this day, this week doesn't matter. There are no unimportant days because the King of Kings already had us in mind to use today to accomplish His plan of grace through us. Each Day of life is a gift to be used. Look at verse 7, Ephesians 1. To the praise of the glorious grace of Jesus, who loves us, redeemed us with his blood. Forgiveness of sins. Why? 
Verse 8, he's not done because of the riches of God's grace that he lavished on all of us who know and follow Jesus. Ephesians 1.8. So all week long, I'm wrestling, Lord, how, how do we get that on our hard drives and our minds? Because everywhere you turn this world, the message of, you, you can't do it. You're worthless. You're helpless. Numb yourself. Just, just, just live with the fact that, that Jesus doesn't need you. He doesn't really want you. He, he's the king. He'll accomplish his plan without you just fine. How can I automatically put Jesus in his plan? He adopted me. He chose me. He has a destiny. How do I get that on my heart, my mind, and my will? How, how do we do that? And I got I to gotta tell you, I wrestled and I thought, Lord, there's got to be some high-tech way. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll get it on phones, Lord. There's got to be some 2019 way. And he kept saying, it's the card. It's the card, Jeff. And uh, I waited so long, kept saying, there's got to be a better way. That uh, last night at 1030, I'm cutting cards. Uh, so those of you who have the cards, would you stand? Uh, uh, many of you ushers, let, let's get the card to everybody, okay? So finally, I said, I, I, guess, I guess we're going to go with what you've made clear. And I should have uh, responded to about four days earlier. And I'm thinking, Lord, give me something else. He did. He gave, he gave me the card. And, and here's my thought. If you wanted high tech, you ready? Take a picture of the card, okay? Take, take a picture of the card. And then you can put it, you can make it your, your screensaver. You can do a whole lot of things with the card. So make sure everybody gets one of these cards. Um, what is this card? It's from Dr. Neil Anderson's book, Victory Over Darkness. Um, I think I first started talking about this card 20 years ago. Um, but you know what? The truths, the facts, the... The core of this card is who we are as followers of Jesus Christ. So, get the card in your hand, and now let's talk this through a bit. You've been listening to the enemy way too much. You've been believing lies. You've been believing that you're worthless, hopeless, helpless, no plan, no destiny. How do I battle that? It's coming at me fast and furious. How do you battle that? I'm telling you how, you got to get the facts of the card on your hard drive. And for me, every day I got to say out loud lots of the facts. Okay? Now maybe some of you are more advanced and I say, hats off to you. But old school, I got to repeat out loud lots of the facts. Okay? Now I've been doing this long enough, I pretty much have this card memorized by now. But I just got to out loud declare this is true about me because every day there's a part of me that's saying I don't, I, don't, I don't really feel like Ephesians 1 is true about me today. So I got to declare the facts. This is who I am and I, and I just go and, and I'm, I just start. I'm God's child. I'm Christ's friend. Does everybody have their green card? That sounds funny, doesn't it? Does anyone not have a green card? Okay? Then you can't work for Christ if you don't get your green card. Okay? You can't get busy for the team get, unless you get... Everybody got a green card? I, I, okay. I think some of you might need two or three of these because you need to put them in different... One in your car, uh, one tape it in the, on the mirror in the bathroom. I'm just telling one at work. I'm saying this isn't a magic tool, but the truth of who you are. This is the foundation that can powerfully transform who we are. How we see cuz cuz you're either going to take Satan's foundation which leads bad places, even suicide, numbing yourself, or you're going to take the alternative that Jesus Christ has given us in his book. Ready? Okay. We've got a little bit of time. You ready? So so let's declare. Okay, let's read the top, understand your identity in Christ. Absolutely essential to your success at living the victorious Christian life. And I apologize. Um, I'm not very good at copying stuff. So I know it's not perfect. Uh, I, I recognize some of you have got. But you know what? 
I'm accepted even though the cards I made aren't that great. And I'm secure even though I didn't listen for three or four days and I, and I wound up almost chopping my finger off last night. And I'm significant because at least in the end I finally listened and did it Christ's way. Okay, there you go. Uh, so we're going to read this together. Ready? And I know some of you might need to get your reading glasses on, but that's okay. You're reading the Bible anyway, so you already got them on. So, okay, I'm going to read the biblical reference, and I'd encourage you, this can be your homework this week. You can look up. Is this true? Are these facts true? Well, you can look them up. I already have. They are. But, you you know, be from Missouri. Show me. And that's all good. Okay, I'm going to read John 1.12, and then you're going to tell me the truth that's related to that. Okay, here we go. John 1.12 says, I am. John 15.15 15 tells us. And Romans 5.1 declares. 1 Corinthians 6.17 says. 1 Corinthians. Sorry about that. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 declares about us. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Ephesians 1, 1. Really? Yes. Ephesians 1, 5. Ephesians 2, 18. Colossians 1, verse 14. Colossians 2 and verse 10. I'm telling you, if you repeat that daily, okay? And some of you, once a day is not going to be enough, okay? You're, you're going to need to fast and furious get some of this on the hard drive, on your mind, saying it out loud. Got it? So that's the I am accepted. You ready? Let's do I am secure. Romans 8, 1 and 2. Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 31 to 34. Romans 8, 35 to 39. 2 Corinthians 1, 21, 22. Colossians, mm, I got a smudge here, 2 and verse 3. Philippians 1, verse 6. Philippians 3, verse 20. 2 Timothy 1, 7. Pastor Brent quoted that when he prayed. Hebrews 4, verse 16. 1 John 5, 18. Okay, so I'm accepted, I'm secure, I'm significant. And again, it's not because I'm a big deal, it's because Jesus in me makes us significant. Here we go, Mark 5, 13 and 14. John 15, 1 and 5. John 15, verse 16. Acts 1, 8. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. 2 Corinthians 6, 1. Ephesians 2.6, Ephesians 2.10, Ephesians 3, verse 12, Philippians 4, verse 13. I'm telling you, if you'll ask the Lord, Lord, make, make these truths real alive, and a part of my daily life. Can I, can I, give me your eyes. Throw me your eyeballs, yeah. Brent said every time I say that, he thinks of tossing his eyes up. Uh, 
So now I'm viewing it that way too. Toss me your eyeballs. If you'll, if you'll start daily and allow this to get on your hard drive and become a part of your words and a part of your everyday life, it'll change you. More than anything I know of, when I start saying, this is God's word, it's true about me, I believe it, I think it, I speak it, I live it, it will change you. Can I just say something real obvious? Because I'm the master of the obvious, you know. It's my job. It's going to take some work. And the reason some of you won't work this, it's too hard. I don't have time. So, so you have time to live in despair. So you have time to live as though you're worthless and helpless and hopeless and have no purpose and to be a slave of sin. And a sl You have time for that? Really? You, you really have time for that, but you don't have time to live free? It'll change you. And my prayer is that you'd be changed. I'm telling you what, if you all get this hard drive going, it'll change northern Michigan. You understand? It'll change. It'll change your family. It'll change your marriage. It'll change your children and grandchildren. Let's pray. Lord, we uh, declare that you've given us everything we need to live victoriously. And the facts that we just read seem too good to be true. But they're true. So Lord, would you help us to start working at getting the foundation of who we are, and it's not because we're a big deal, it's all because of... Would you help us to get your grace, your accomplishments, the truth that flows out of that to be a part of our daily lives. Lord, we want to see lives changed around us. We want to see our marriages flourish. We want to see our children following strong after you. Our grandkids uh, live in the legacy. Lord, we desire to see our neighbors and our co-workers and the people we go to school with. Lord, we want to see people touched with these facts. But they're never going to buy in until they see them in us first. Whatever it takes, Lord, would you help us to get these, uh, these truths about our new identity in you down at the foundation of our being? We love you, Lord. Thanks for choosing us <laughs> way back before there was anything. Thanks for having us in mind. Thank you for adopting us. Thank you for making us a part of your forever family. Wow. We love you. That's grace. <laughs> that is sheer, extravagant grace. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray all these things. I'm going to close kind of in a simple way. But just the way that feels right. Would you join with me? First verse, kind of like the theme song of this series. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now. I see. May King Jesus get this foundation on each of our hearts, minds, and wills. Lord, work powerfully so that we're willing to do whatever it takes.
It's in Jesus' awesome name.